Tonight, horrifying details emerge of a disaster off California's coast. Bitty, bitty, bitty. Dozens of passengers trapped below deck as fire rips through their boat. What happened? I can't breathe. Hurricane Dorian slams the Bahamas and targets the U.S. Southeast. Over here. Allegations of racism and fear-mongering. Rosemary on why the fight for your vote could get ugly. And also tonight, we're in Hong Kong. Students fill the streets in protest as China signals it's had enough. This is The National. A Labor Day excursion turned to tragedy off the coast of California early this morning. A tour boat with 38 people on board suddenly burst into flames. Despite an all-day search, most are still missing tonight. Five crew members managed to save themselves, but the passengers asleep below deck. And they may have been locked in. Ellen Morrow has the details, including a chilling distress call. The Mayday calls the fierce flames both harrowing enough. Now consider the more than 30 passengers asleep below deck when the fire broke out. What is your position and number of persons on board? Over. The dispatcher asks two other gut-wrenching questions. Roger, are they locked inside the boat? Roger, can you get back on board and unlock the boat, uh, lock, unlock the doors so they can get off? We don't hear the answers. Online reviews of the boat named Conception suggest this is where the passengers were sleeping as flames ripped through. Still today, officials try to keep hope alive. Right now, they're conducting shoreline searches to, for any, any, any available survivors. But only five crew members awake when the fire broke out say authorities are known to have made it out alive. It's unclear if they were able to try to help the passengers. It's very surreal at the moment. Uh, when I came over here, I tried to get a hold of them and their number had been disconnected, the Coast Guard, or had been changed. So I imagine there's a lot of people running around trying to get some information. Our custom-built boats. Conception was a scuba diving tour boat that people stay on for several days. It was on a three-day excursion docked off Santa Cruz Island near the Southern California coast. Dean Child says he was a regular passenger on the vessel. It's a top-notch outfit. I can't believe that this happened to him. It's just horrible to think that people could have been trapped down in that bunk room. Now the scramble is on for authorities to determine the cause of the blaze. Officials say the boat had no prior violations. The vessel has been in compliance has been in full compliance. Uh, we are working we are working deliberately with the vessel owner operator who is with us at this time, working on a plan to to conduct further further assistance for his vessel. And for the loved ones of those who were on board, a painful waiting game for answers. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Now, people on the opposite U.S. coast are bracing for Hurricane Dorian. It's a Category 4 storm that's claimed at least five lives in the Bahamas after spending more than a day destroying parts of the islands. Today's main target, Grand Bahama Island. A storm surge up to seven meters high pushed the ocean to the tops of palm trees. The front yard view of the house that I'm in and right into people's homes, trapping them while the storm raged outside. This is the water by my back door and glass. There are reports of some people having to cut through their own roofs to escape the rising water. The police today telling people, try to find something that floats because crews just can't get through the storm to help them. It's almost like the island has been completely reclaimed by the ocean. Among the thousands riding it out, Canadians like Tim Tibbetts hold up in a house with 13 other people left to hope for the best. We've lost touch with so many people that we knew were in really deep trouble. Um, you know, good friends. And we have no idea where they are. It's really hard. As many as 13,000 homes are believed to have been destroyed or severely damaged on the islands. Complete devastation. Look at these cars, man. Great Abaco Island, where Dorian made landfall yesterday, it lay in ruins today. We need help, everything now. And for the survivors, those who weathered the storm, they're grateful they made it through it all. I still get life. Thank God for life, I can rebuild. 
So here's the map that matters for the time being, where Dorian is forecasted to go next, sideswiping the coast of Florida, then making a sharp turn to head northeast. By Saturday, its winds could be felt in Nova Scotia. David Common is in Palm Beach, Florida tonight, where the weather just getting started. Andrew, after days of nervous waiting, days of preparing, the wind and rain that we have long been waiting for is making its way into Florida. I moved here from Ohio yep. in November, and I think I would take a tornado any day. Over, You have five days of it's coming, it's not, it's coming, it's the whole preparation thing, and then you have to wait till the last second anyway. Not long after the bustling streets emptied, gas stations ran dry, hospitals were evacuated. The last windows covered over and shelters filled up. A waiting game for a giant storm whose arrival has been repeatedly delayed. Inside that storm, on board a plane collecting data, the delay can be explained while lightning and tornadic winds curl the storm itself is creeping forward very slowly, maximizing its time for destruction. So we're going to have a hurricane throughout the entire week, even going into next weekend. So that's a long time to have a hurricane. 16,000 utility workers from across the country are now in Florida staging for the cleanup. First, though, the storm must pass. And new projections of the hurricane's path tonight suggest that hurricane strength winds are not likely to strike Florida. Doesn't mean the danger is gone. There are likely still to be electrical outages tonight, and we're already hearing about some flooding. It's just that the worst that Dorian is capable of is not likely now to occur in Florida. In addition to that, while we saw the hurricane stalled over the Bahamas, it is expected perhaps that overnight it's going to turn northwards and rapidly pick up speed going through much of Florida through tomorrow, perhaps even getting all the way with its early wind stages into Georgia by tomorrow night. Andrew? Thanks very much, David. Now let's take you to Hong Kong, where things have been developing overnight after anti-government protesters launched their 14th straight week of unrest. Adrian, you've been following the action. They're all through the night and now into mm -hmm. Tuesday. So, Andrew, about 100,000 students skipped that first day of the school year to take part in a strike, and those very protests have really disrupted the city. They're putting immense pressure on Hong Kong's leader, Carrie Lam, and for the first time since the protests began, there are signs that she'd actually like to step down. So I'm standing outside the offices of the central government. That is where she has been holding one of her regular news conferences today. We'll have more on what she's saying in a moment, but first, here's how students mobilized against Beijing's tightening grip. Defiance again. School was supposed to start today in Hong Kong, but they didn't go. High school and college students on strike. Some have had an entire summer of hard learning on the streets, and it seems there's energy for more. Hong Kong, though, has to find a way out of this mess. And for the very first time, there's a hint of accountability for it. The Reuters news agency obtained an audio recording of the chief executive, Carrie Lam, reportedly speaking with business people here, seeming to take responsibility for the 13-week unraveling. For a chief executive to have caused this, this huge havoc to Hong Kong is unforgivable. It's just unforgivable. If I have a choice, the first thing is to quit. If she has a choice, that's a key phrase. Lamb appearing to go to great lengths in the recording to point out her powerlessness. The political room for the chief executive, who unfortunately has to serve two masters by constitution, that is the central people's government and the people of Hong Kong, that political room for maneuvering is very, very, very limited. <laughs> It is rage at Beijing's tight grip that seemed to be behind the ripping down and burning of the flag this weekend, a move that incensed China. Chinese state media warning the protesters the end for them is near. But how? When? The students know their demands for the withdrawal of the extradition bill for universal suffrage for an inquiry into police brutality are pushing China. 
and pushing their relationships. Will you win? Um, well, we, I, we hope we can win, yeah. <laughs> of course. Are there people in your family who are on another side from you, who try to convince you not to do this? Yes, my family is uh, other side, and they very support the government and the Hong Kong police to keep uh, fights with our protesters. Uh, Do they tell well, you you're the, wrong? Yeah, always. The divides are deepening here, and as night fell, the rage intensified again. Oh. The clash is picking up. <laughs> However, Beijing decides to respond could make all this so much worse. Okay, so we have just been listening to what Carrie Lam has been saying uh, at her news conference. She apologized to tourists for the disruption. She says it's very inappropriate that the audio of that private conversation was leaked, and she emphasized that she's not going to resign. Have a listen to what she's saying. You said if you had a choice, you would quit. So why won't China let you resign? No, the, um, the, the simple and strict answer to your question is I have never tendered any resignation to the central people's government. So um, your answer does not arise. I have never tendered any resignation. Interesting to hear her address this. Adrian, you had a chance to speak with Anson Chan. Uh, she was second in command in Hong Kong 20 years ago during the handover from British to Chinese rule. W what does she have to say about the way Carrie Lam's handled all of this? Well, Andrea, it really was fascinating. She spoke very frankly about whether Lam can stand up to Beijing. She has a, a strong assessment of this woman. Have a listen. She has a reputation of being intelligent, hardworking, but not a team player. Uh, she doesn't encourage people around her to speak truth unto power. And I think that's a fatal flaw in any leader. And so we will be back later in the hour, Andrew, with that full interview. Okay, sounds good, Adrian. Okay, well, exactly seven weeks from tonight. And at this exact moment, in fact, we will have election results. Now, technically, the election hasn't even been called yet. But unofficially, make no mistake, the campaign is already well underway. And leaders from the three major parties spent the day shaking hands. Yes. Yes. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh started the holiday Monday with an appearance in Toronto. He vowed support for contract workers and to raise the federal minimum wage. The next prime minister. Yeah. Down the highway, conservative leader Andrew Scheer got in some tailgating at the Tiger Cat Argo football game. He was accompanied by former Thai Cat Peter Diakowski, who's running for the conservatives. Take a picture of And the prime minister, Justin Trudeau, was also in Hamilton marching with labor leaders in the city's parade. But when they were met by a group of protesters, security stepped in and took them away from any potential trouble. And Rosie is leading our election coverage, kicking it off tonight in Ottawa, overlooking Parliament Hill. Andrew, it would be quiet here anyway, because of course it is a holiday, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Uh, the war rooms, for instance, gearing up. There are staffers moving in. Signs are being printed. Candidates certainly already out door knocking almost every single day already. Sure signs an election call is coming fast. And this weekend, we got a sense of just how divisive this campaign could be when an Ontario MPP was confronted by racist comments. Katie Simpson has those details. With his camera phone rolling, a far-right anti-immigration agitator launches into a tirade, confronting Ontario politician Gurathan Singh at a Muslim community gathering. What about Sharia? Do you support Sharia? Come on, come on speak the truth. Why are you hiding, buddy? Singh, like his brother, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, is Sikh. The incident ended when security stepped in. I'm proud of my brother for responding uh, with strength, uh, responding clearly that that is wrong. Jugmeet Singh says what happened to his brother is not an uncommon experience for Canadians of diverse backgrounds. A spokesman for the Prime Minister said racism and discrimination have no place in Canada, a sentiment echoed by the Conservatives. 
like all political leaders have an, ob uh, an obligation to promote that the kind of uh, re respectful dialogue on issues and, and not make one's identity uh, a part of the debate. As the first non-white leader of a Canadian federal party, Jugmeet Singh has been the target of a similar attack. We believe in love and courage, right? Singh love received international praise for shutting down a racist love heckler during the 2017 courage. NDP leadership race. But the co-founder of the Anti-Hate Network expects to see more of this during the federal campaign. So we're seeing more and more of this kind of creep into mainstream politics. He we're says not only have hate with. groups been emboldened by the Trump administration, but that Canadian what groups have been Trump motivated Trump to speak Trump out Trump over Trump issues Trump like the Liberal Trump government's Trump motion, Trump which Trump condemned Trump Islamophobia. Trump gave kind of hate movements energy, and then they found lightning rods, specific Canadian issues that brought them out to the streets. Organizers of Sunday's event say what happened is unfortunate. And while the heckler left the festival, they say he lingered nearby until after 11 p.m. when it was over and officials were tearing down. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. So another part of what will make this campaign so divisive are wedge issues, essentially when you're trying to distinguish yourself from your opponents. And this long weekend, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer used one in a tweet about the Liberals' approach to crime. Here's why he did it. Uh, it has chilled even the most hardened police officer to the bone. Uh, we in the support group are, uh, feel desperate about this business. And as I say, we will give 110%. The tweet linked to a British tabloid report about child killer John Venables. He was one of two 10-year-olds convicted of murdering toddler Jamie Bulger in the UK back in 1993. How old was Jamie? Venables is now 36 and has been living under a new identity. The article speculated Venables, who is about to be released from prison on new charges of possessing child abuse images, would be sent to Canada even though he has no ties to this country. Scheer said he would not allow it and called on the Prime Minister to do the same. But here's the issue. This same story was bounced around earlier this summer and government officials shut it down then, saying, as they did today, people who are inadmissible to Canada include those who have a criminal record or has committed an act outside Canada that would be a crime in Canada. So why would Sheer bother to repeat a story that has been denied twice now and that appears to be unfounded? It allows the Conservatives to suggest that Liberals are somehow soft on crime, which all parties know is an important issue for women voters, a key demographic for all parties if they want to win the fall election. So the writ hasn't been dropped yet, but the parties will spend the next seven weeks vying for your vote, and we will make sure you have all the information you need. Uh, later in the hour, we will go in depth. It's a campaign full of firsts. Trudeau's first shot at re-election, Scheer and Singh's first runs as leaders, possibly the Green Party's first chance at a breakthrough. Your 2019 election primer coming up. Now back to you, Andrew. And up next, block Brexit and you could lose your job. Boris Johnson threatens British MPs with an election unless they reach a deal. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back. Let's get to Ian in our network newsroom in Vancouver. Ian, you're watching developing stories across Canada tonight. And Andrew, let's start in Alberta where it's 1020 and where Labor Day Monday has been marked by a pair of fires in the province's biggest cities. In Edmonton, one person is in critical condition after being pulled out of a condo fire this afternoon. Two others were taken to hospital with unknown injuries. In Calgary, a terrifyingly close call for a couple after their home was hit by lightning and caught fire overnight. They weren't hurt, but the fire did major damage to the home, destroying part of the roof and getting into the home's electrical system. The lights had exploded and the lights had uh, all been burnt out and even a light switch had exploded and burst out of the wall. And the couple have been told not to go back into their homes yet. In southern Alberta, an evacuation order has now been lifted following the derailment of a Canadian Pacific train early this morning. CP says the accident happened uh, more than 12 hours ago, about 40 kilometers north of Lethbridge. Three rail cars were reportedly leaking octane, a flammable and volatile component of gasoline. Officials say two of the leaks have been contained, but crews will be working into the night on the third. No word yet on the cause of the crash. 
And we're also keeping a close eye on Arthur Ashe Stadium in New York tonight as Canada's Bianca Andreescu is playing for a shot at her first ever U.S. Open quarterfinals. The 19-year-old got off to a quick start, winning the first set 6-1 against American Taylor Townsend. The Townsend struck back, taking the second set 6-4. The third set will determine who moves on. Andrescu is the only Canadian left in the U.S. Open, and she's the youngest player still in the tournament. More stories developing tonight in 20 minutes, but Andrew, back to you. Let's go to the UK. Conservative MPs face a critical choice tomorrow. They're being told, back your prime minister or else face a snap election next month. It's all to do with the thought that Brexit could happen very soon, but without a clear deal in place to manage the impact. And some of Boris Johnson's own MPs may vote against him. Cameron McIntosh now on a standoff of parliamentary proportions. A camera-friendly distraction. You gotta hope Boris Johnson's new rescue dog isn't scared of noise. Once again, outside the gates of Downing Street, angry protests. I want to see the government fall and a general election. Essentially, he's uh, stopping MPs from debating uh, what is one of the most serious issues of our time. Easily heard over the Prime Minister. We're leaving on the 31st of October, no ifs. Or buts. As Johnson doubled down on his promise to see Brexit through, even without a deal. We will not accept any attempt to go back on our promises or scrub that referendum. It's an example of the tension that's gripping this country, with Parliament set to resume for just a few short days. Opposition parties are set to introduce legislation, likely their last chance to block a no-deal Brexit. <laughs> Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn is proposing to push back the deadline again. We? Oui? are working with other parties to do everything necessary to pull our country back from the brink. Then we need a general election. Some Conservative MPs appear ready to vote with them, potentially defeating their own government. Former Cabinet and Minister David Gawke. I don't want to be complicit for allowing something to happen, which I think would be a huge mistake for this country. No deal. This evening, Johnson held an emergency Cabinet meeting to discuss an election. While still insisting publicly over the protests, he can get a deal if his MPs don't undermine him. If they do, they will plainly chop the legs out from under the UK position and make any further negotiation absolutely impossible. It's no sure thing Johnson would lose an election. Some speculate he may even let his government fall to get a new mandate. All of it shaping up to be a dramatic week as the Brexit stakes at Westminster keep getting higher. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, London. And up next on The National, Rosie takes us in-depth. The countdown is on to the federal election. What you need to know before the writ drops about the people hoping to be your next prime minister. Canada is certainly ready for the writ to be dropped. Its distribution centre is busy packaging material to send to returning offices across the country. And this year there's also a pretty high demand from teachers who want their students to follow the campaigns as well. So we will of course be following along and bringing you everything you need to know to cast your vote eventually from here in Ottawa and indeed across the country. Tonight though, to kick off our campaign coverage, we go in depth on the challenges facing each party leader. The next election is about the kind of country we want to live in and who we want to be as Canadians. Justin Trudeau may arguably be the most experienced campaigner of this election, but he is also about to do something he has never done before. And we're gonna need those votes out Run as a prime minister on a record of his own government asking to continue the work with another mandate. In October, we've got a choice to make. I am for moving forward. But moving ahead also means looking back at what has and has not been done. Liberals will happily talk more about giving more money to Canadian families with a bigger child tax credit, 
concluding trade deals, including NAFTA, keeping the economy growing, progressing on the path to reconciliation, and fighting climate change with a carbon tax across the country. But there have been mistakes, too, that are opportunities for Trudeau's opponents. An ill-fated trip to India that was roundly mocked and proved perhaps more trouble than it was worth. A vacation to the Aga Khan's private island, which contravened the Ethics Act. At one point, you didn't say mistake. to yourself, this is not Obviously. maybe the best thing to do? You never the Aga thought Khan that? is uh, someone who has been a longtime friend uh, of my family's. Electoral promises have been broken. Democratic reform abandoned. The promise of balanced budgets left behind. The trust that previously existed between these two individuals and our team has been broken. To say nothing of the SNC-Lavalin controversy, which cost the Prime Minister two cabinet ministers and one of his most trusted advisers, did much damage in public opinion polls and again concluded with the ethics commissioner saying Trudeau had broken the rules by trying to pressure his former justice minister. The choice is very clear right now between going back to the cuts and austerity of the Harper years or continuing to move forward. Campaigning is something Trudeau thrives on. Give me high fives. And opponents have seen how underestimating him is a mistake. And the next leader of the Conservative Party of Canada with 51% of the vote, Andrew Scheer. <laughs> Andrew Scheer has now been leader of the Conservative Party since 2017, beating out more than a dozen others to replace Stephen Harper. Canadians cannot afford four more years of Justin Trudeau. But quickly, he was painted as Harper with a smile. You're either described as the smiling Stephen Harper or Stephen Harper with a smile. Uh, what's, <laughs> what's your take on that description? Well, I, I think that's a, a fairly accurate description. Scheer has never faced a national federal campaign as leader before, but he's been a politician since the age of 25. I know the uh, Honourable Leader of the Opposition will want to avoid using terminology like that. Much of that time was spent in the more neutral role of Speaker of the House of Commons, the youngest ever named. This is what is disgusting about this. They are using the very real threat of hatred and racism in this country yes. to cover up their corruption scandal. Yeah. Scheer quickly embraced his role as leader of the official opposition, pushing the Prime Minister to defend his government's record. But at times, the effort to look tough has seemed uncomfortable and forced. Scheer is far from a household name. That will be one of his biggest challenges. But his policies will be familiar to Conservatives, dump the carbon tax and give money back to Canadians to spend as they see fit. My plan for Canadians? Lower the cost of living and leave more money in your pockets. Scheer has his own challenges, having supported socially conservative positions, particularly against same-sex marriage, that he is now struggling to defend. Uh, my personal views are that every single Canadian has the same uh, quality rights under the law, and I will continue to uphold that. It may be his first campaign, but conservatives say he's been preparing for months and is ready. As your new leader, Jagmeet Singh is new to politics, at least at the national level. A member of the Ontario legislature since 2011, Singh decided to take the plunge into federal politics in 2017 after Tom Mulcair was pushed out of the NDP. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Thanks so much for being here. The jump was a big one, and Singh faced some criticism even from inside his own party for not running for a seat for almost a full year. Can you uh, tell us whether or not your caucus is behind you in supporting this bill? Uh, at this point, that's, I'm, I'm, you know, just give me a moment. I'm absolutely clarified. Do, do we know where Singh struggled to get a handle on federal politics and the NDP's positions. He has since pushed party policies like universal pharmacare and affordable housing. Imagine instead a government in Ottawa that actually works for you. Singh has other challenges too. The NDP hasn't raised as much money as it needs for this campaign and has yet to name about half of the candidates across the country. We're out sharing our message, connecting with people. This election could be make or break for Singh, but it may also be a defining moment for the NDP and its future. I love telling people all the reasons why even one Green elected to a parliament or legislature can make a really big difference. This is hardly Elizabeth May's first campaign, but it may be the first one where a real breakthrough is possible. She still holds the title of the first Green Party seat claimed federally in 2011. 
There was some more success for the party when they managed to add a seat with Paul Manley's by-election win earlier this year. But in many ways, it is the success of the Greens at the provincial level that has given May newfound hope and momentum. The party now has seats in BC, PEI, New Brunswick and Ontario, some 15 elected legislators. So we are facing a larger threat than the human species has ever threat been faced with before. May has said fighting climate change requires a much more urgent response, and so she is proposing to double Canada's current greenhouse gas reduction targets. Climate change may be of critical importance to many voters, but May will have to defend her ambitious plan like never before. For with more interest comes more scrutiny. One year ago, I decided to offer Canadians a new vision of our country. Maxime Bernier left the Conservative Party last August, bitterly railing against the party that had made him a cabinet minister in Stephen Harper's government and that he had tried to lead and failed. This party is too intellectually and morally corrupt to be reformed. He rather quickly struck out on his own and established the People's Party of Canada. Bernier describes it as a coalition of people fed up with the traditional parties and in favour of what he dubs smart populism. Bernier says he believes in climate change, but denies it is man-made and he'll do nothing to tackle it. Wants to drastically cut taxes and slash immigration levels in Canada. We need to have fewer immigrants, but we need to be sure that these people would be able to integrate our society, to be part of our society. That sentiment in particular has been viewed as anti-immigrant. And while Bernier has tapped into some disaffected voters, he has also attracted neo-Nazis, though he has said they are not welcome in his party. Bernier may be fielding a full slate of candidates and making a real play in this election, but if he cannot shake off those criticisms and grow his support, he may find himself a leader with no party behind him. De toutes les luttes. Celle de la langue française et celle de l'indépendance du Québec. And will there be a resurgence from the sovereignist bloc québécois? Yves-François Blanchet is the fifth leader of the bloc since 2011. The beleaguered party hasn't held official party status in Parliament for the last eight years. The erosion of the sovereignty movement will continue to be a challenge this election. Each of the leaders and their strengths and weaknesses will soon be tested. And on October 21st, Canadians will decide just who deserves electoral success. Okay, Rosie. And, and of course, I mean, bearing in mind we are seven weeks out, the best sense we have right now of how all this shakes out is from the polls. That's right. It can at least give us a sense, right? And CBC's poll tracker is up and running. Our polls analyst, Eric Grenier, is going to update it daily or even more than daily if needed. So here's what his numbers show us right now, Andrew. The Conservatives have led in the polls since February. That's when the SNC Lavalin story broke. But the lead over the Liberals has narrowed over the course of the summer. The two parties really in a virtual tie right now. Let me show you what Eric uh, has found in terms of projections for seats. Each party can win, as you can see there as well. Uh, the Liberals favor to win the most seats, but whether any party can actually win a majority is still very much a toss-up. Yeah, no doubt. And Rosie, do you get to get any sleep over the next few weeks? It's going to be busy. No, I don't think sleep <laughs> is on the agenda, but that's fine. Seven weeks until voting day, and until then, we'll have you covered here on The National. Okay, good stuff. Starting tomorrow night, we're hitting the road, visiting key battleground ridings, exploring the issues that matter to you. Sunday nights on The National will be focused on the election with a new political panel that will take you inside campaign war rooms. And this Thursday, watch out for our new podcast, Party Lines. BuzzFeed's Elamin Abdel Mahmoud and I will go beyond the talking points to make politics make sense. All right. Good stuff. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Rosie. Okay, you bet. And we're back in two minutes' time with more from Adrian in Hong Kong. And still ahead, our moment. Imagine having to land this tiny plane on the very first time you set foot in it. Crazy story coming up. In these latest pictures from Hong Kong, police seem to be arresting a protester. The popular uprising now in its 14th week has yet to diminish Beijing's resolve to tighten control on the people who live here, including 300,000 Canadians. 
And so I had a chance to sit down uh, for a conversation with Anson Chen. She was the second in command here when Hong Kong was transferred from British to Chinese rule more than 20 years ago. She was pretty clear about why she thinks things are going wrong here and what she believes can be done to make it right, including what Canada can do. Anson Chen was the chief secretary in Hong Kong just before and after the 1997 handover to Chinese rule. She made the case to the world about a bright future. This is not what she envisioned, and she says she has real regrets. I am angry. Uh, I never envisaged this happening. Uh, I was saying to uh, a friend just uh, last week, if I could have foreseen mm, what would happen to Hong Kong today, mm, I would have done the selling of the joint declaration much less enthusiastically than I did at that time. But of course, the China that negotiated the joint declaration in 1984 is a very different China from today. Are you we were never asked to, to love and embrace the uh, Communist Party. Mm -hmm. That wasn't part of the uh, deal. China's grip has been tightening here for a while. The pressures on the chief executive, Carrie Lam, are serious. Her office declined our request for an interview, but Chan has prophetic insight into how she thinks Lam is struggling. It is very much up to the chief executive to explain and to persuade Beijing that the current tactics are all wrong. But of course, uh, I have the impression that she's lost all will to govern. That echoes the essence of audio released by the Reuters news agency tonight. Lamb reportedly speaking with business people last week, saying the chaos she caused is unforgivable. If I have a choice, the first thing is to quit. Do you have any sort of relationship with Carrie Lamb? She was a very junior officer when I was chief secretary. She has a reputation of being intelligent, hardworking, but not a team player. She doesn't encourage people around her to speak truth unto power. And I think that's a fatal flaw in any leader. So if there's no incentive to listen to the people, no capacity to challenge Beijing, what changes the course? The rest of the world, Chen believes, that means Canada too. You are genuine stakeholders in Hong Kong. You have huge investments here. You have 300,000 Canadians living here. Mm. Their safety mm, uh, and their welfare must also be your concern. America is considering passing a special bill on Hong Kong's human rights and democracy, in which, amongst other things, they're going to impose sanctions on individuals mm, that um, uh, breach one country, two systems, and fundamental rights and freedoms. Perhaps this is something that the Canadian government can also consider. This is not a fight that we can win on our own. Those in the streets may not necessarily agree with Chan. The Hong Kong she knew may have changed. They're determined to be the ones to keep changing it. So as the story continues to change, and make no mistake, it will, we'll have more coverage this week from right here in Hong Kong. Until then, we'll send it back to Canada. All right, Adrian, and Ian is back in two minutes with more developing stories. Welcome back to the Network Newsroom in Vancouver, where we're tracking developing stories, including new details about the gunman in that deadly rampage in Texas on Saturday. Police say he had been fired from his job just hours earlier. He didn't wake up Saturday morning and walk into his company, and, and then it happened. He went to that company in trouble. Uh, He's probably been in trouble for a while. After Seth Ator was fired, police say both he and his employer called 911 to complain about each other. The gunman also called the FBI national tip line but made no threats. He later was pulled over for not using a turn signal and that is when the rampage began. Seven people were killed and 22 were hurt. Protesters arrested during Boston's so-called straight pride parade will be in court tomorrow. Three dozen people were arrested at Saturday's event. A group calling itself Super Happy Fun America organized it, saying it believes straight people are the oppressed majority. The parade was met with a larger counter-protest from LGBTQ supporters. 
And the wife of actor and comedian Kevin Hart says he's going to be just fine following a weekend car crash. Hart was a passenger in his car early Sunday. The 28-year-old driver lost control. The vehicle went down an embankment. California Highway Patrol says both men suffered major back injuries and were taken to hospital. The cause of the crash is still under investigation, but police say the driver had not been drinking. Coming up next on The National, an update on a special investigation. What's happened since CBC News revealed that hundreds of coaches convicted of sexual offenses were promises to keep kids safe kept? We're back in two minutes. Nearly six months ago, a CBC News investigation found at least 222 coaches involved in amateur sports across Canada had been convicted of sexual offenses against young people over the course of two decades. The government promised change. So with students heading back to school and sports teams gearing up for the fall, Jamie Strachan checks in on whether those promises were kept. When CBC revealed hundreds of coaches across several sports had been convicted of sexual offenses against minors, it hit a nerve at the highest level. I'm heartbroken and I'm angered. Federal Minister of Science and Sport Kirsty Duncan promptly made a flurry of announcements and promises. Today we are announcing two important measures. A key promise was the launch of the Canadian Sport Helpline, a 1-800 number and website to report or seek advice about potential abuse. It's been six months since that announcement. CBC checked the websites of nearly 50 of Canada's largest sport organizations and found barely half have a mention of the helpline, including sports that draw thousands of kids around the country, such as hockey, gymnastics and basketball. CBC showed Duncan what we found. The minister says she's asked officials to follow up with individual organizations to ensure the helpline is being promoted. We've done what we can. There's more, more to be done to raise the profile. By contrast, in the U.S., a similar resource is front and centre on most national sport websites. Sandra Kirby, a former Olympic rower, has researched abuse in sports for years. Sport organizations themselves seem moribund to do anything, partly out of fear and partly out of they just simply hope it's going to go away. Jesse Harrison helps run a youth baseball league in Toronto that's home to more than a thousand players. It's one of dozens of local organizations that we contacted that said they'd heard nothing about the helpline or been given any new guidance on how to deal with reports of sexual abuse. I feel like it's a relatively easy thing to begin to address and start those conversations, but it's definitely fallen off the, off the radar. Meanwhile, the problem isn't going away. In the first eight months of 2019, another 22 coaches across Canada have been charged with a sexual offence against a minor. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. OK, time for a quick break, but when we come back... Do you know how to operate the aeroplane? Very, very light. This is my first um, lesson. The moment a flying lesson took a terrifying turn. Next. What you're looking at here is a sight worth celebrating. A plane safely on the ground, landed by a man who not only was just learning to fly, but who was also dealing with a crisis. Now, it was Max Sylvester's first time in that two-seater Cessna when his flight instructor passed out at the controls. The dramatic landing that followed is our moment tonight. Tango Foxtrot Romeo, do you know how to operate the aeroplane? Very, very light. This is my first um, lesson. Max Sylvester told air traffic control his instructor was slumped against his shoulder. The plane was now in his hands. Your instructor communicating at all? No, he's not. Thank you, Foxtrot Romeo. That's okay. Your, your job right now is just keep focusing on that aircraft um, as best you can. Um, secondary to that is just to keep his head upright. You're doing really, really well. You're doing an amazing job. Yeah, well, my flight instructor did say that I was the best student he's had. And consider this, watching from below his wife and three kids. Sylvester made several passes of the runway, then finally brought that plane down. It's one of the things that you never, ever hear about, you know, only in movies that you would hear about something like this happening. 
And so, uh, as I watch that, I don't know about you guys, but my heart is just up in my throat the entire time. I don't know what to think. I don't know how he did it either. You know, we've heard tapes of... Yeah, I, I don't, I don't sorry, think I would have done it. I was just going to say, I don't think I would have done it. I think I would have just let it crash. <laughs> We've heard amazing tape from 911 operators, similar here with the air traffic controller, though he did ask the question that I feel like every air traffic controller dreads, and that question being, do you know how to land a plane? <laughs> yeah, gosh. Uh, and, and, and the kicker, I think, is just the fact that his family, uh, that they were watching from below, that's, that's got to have been a terrifying experience for everyone involved. That's The National for the September 2nd. Have a good night. Good night.